horrors. It's fabulous, fabulous. Now, I'm going to tell you a few things. Well, when you stop talking, I'll, I'll introduce Mr. Nesbitt, okay? We consider it an honor to have with us today the most successful retailer current, presently. The Executive Vice President and COO, Chief Operating Officer of Chico is here with us. Chico's Fast Incorporated. Prior to his position at Chico's, Mr. Nesbitt spent 20 years with Sara Lee Corporation. He was the corporate VP and also he became president and CEO of Sara Lee Intimates. His contribution earned him the Vendor of the Year Award, which I think was given by Walmart and many of the well-known uh, 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 corporations, which uh, I'm going to allow uh, some room for Mr. Nesbitt to tell you more about that. Uh, he also will be receiving the famous Hug Award from the prestigious Intimate Apparel Square Club who raises money for Rusk Institute's inc uh, children who, have, uh, uh, who are incapacitated. They contributed millions of dollars through the years. They've built a wonderful playground on 34th Street near, I think, 1st or 2nd. It's, it, it's really amazing. The, the playground is designed to help children who have handicaps be able to have the same fun as those who don't. And I love that. Uh, that Hug Award is very special, and I know that um, Mr. Nesbitt feels that way too. It's a very uh, special award, and he will have it on Wednesday. He also, a few years ago, won the Femi Award from the Under Fashion Club. That's another intimate apparel club that provides scholarships. Uh, his education speaks for itself. He's a graduate of the University of Virginia with a bachelor's in uh, degree in the study of American government. Very needed. And he has a master's from Wake Forest University. Mr. Nesbitt and his wife Susan, who is, I'm so happy to say, is here today, they reside in Fort Myers, Florida, and their daughter is attending Wake Forest University, following in her father's footsteps the alma mater of, his da of her, her daddy. From, I'm not going to say another word because I always feel I spoke too much. I will now ask Mr. Chuck Nesbitt to come and take this away. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'd like to frame this a little bit. First of all, since you all are in fashion merchandising, you know that the suit I'm wearing is about five years old. It is not current. That's because no one at Chico's wears business attire. I would more likely be here in flip-flops, a t-shirt, and shorts, but uh, that the, it wasn't quite the setting here in New York. The weather wasn't right in New York today. So uh, anyway, you, you, you do not see a t typical Chico standing in front of you. Um, call me Chuck. Only my mother calls me Charles. And um, I'd like this to be a, an informative day, uh, tell you a little bit about what has been a retail phenomenon over the past 10 years, uh, if you followed our company. We are more than Chico's. We are also White House Black Market. I noticed uh, most of you are not in the Chico's demographic, but some of you may know White House Black Market. Anyone know that? Yes. Uh, we opened our first store in Manhattan this morning at 9.30. Uh, and I uh, was there for the ribbon cutting, and I hope you'll go by and see it, and uh, to incent you, I have uh, some cards which will help you purchasing there uh, if you would like. Um, 
I am, uh, as Alice mentioned, I did begin my career on the manufacturing side of the business. Most of my career has been in intimate apparel. Uh, I uh, have worked with brands such as Ballet, Playtex. I introduced the Wonder Bra in 1994. I've worked with the Hanes brand, the Just My Size brand, the Barely There brand, many of those brands. I was either on the team that introduced them or had something to do with that. So I've, I, I, I consider myself to be a brand builder in apparel. Uh, I've been with Chico's for almost three years. Uh, I, they hired me for my intimate apparel experience. We have a new specialty retail store called Soma. Uh, by December 1st, we will have 53 locations around the country uh, in the, of Soma, which is intimate apparel for more mature women, what we call the Victoria's Secrets graduate. Uh, the closest one here is, the closest two, one is in Menlo Park, New Jersey, one is in Danbury, Connecticut. Uh, ultimately, we'll open one here or more here in the city. Uh, so anyway, today I'm going to tell you a little bit about Chico's, uh, the history of Chico's, our corporate strategies, what we're doing, how we're struggling, well, how we compete in today's market, and how we deal with some of the issues in fashion apparel. So without further ado, uh, anytime I speak, unfortunately, since Ken Lay, Sarbanes-Oxley, all these wonderful things, we have to uh, disqual anything I say. Basically what this says is don't trade the stock on anything I'm about to say. Okay, everybody clear on that? I can save reading through the thing, okay? so. Um, anyway, you, you trade the stock at your own peril. I'm going to begin today with the history of Chico's. I'm going to talk about the current business profile. I'm going to speak to the competition, our business strategies, what we consider to be our success factors, give you a little bit of a financial profile, talk about some of our future challenges, and certainly have a Q&A, and I, and I invite anyone to ask anything that I can help you with in terms of either the intimate apparel business, uh, the manufacturing and wholesale side of apparel, or uh, anything that I might know about specialty retail. Let's see. And I'm somewhat computer challenged, so. In 1983, the company was founded by a couple in their early 40s, Marvin and Helene Grelnick. And you remember when Alice spoke to the company, she said, Chico's FAS. Well, what does FAS mean? FAS stands for Folk Art Specialties. Because when they opened their store on Sanibel Island, they were not selling apparel, they were selling like carved coconuts and pot, Mexican pottery and things that they would pick. Marvin Grelnick, uh, who is a bit of an eclectic gentleman, would hitch a U-Haul trailer to the back of his Jeep and he would drive to Mexico and buy things out of the markets there, handicrafts and so on, and he would bring them back and sell them in this curio shop that they had developed. And on one of his trips, he ran into somebody who was selling cotton sweaters. And he said, eh, Sanibel, sometimes in the spring, in the fall, it gets a little bit cool. These might go in our store. So he brought them back, and they evaporated, literally. In two or three days, they sold them out. And he turns to Helene, and he says, well, I guess we're in the apparel business now. Uh, so that shows you American entrepreneurialism at its finest. They changed their business strategy as soon as they found out what really sold. So the company then, so Marvin became intrigued with cotton resort wear is essentially how he originally defined the business. And of course, in Sanibel, what he was noticing was there was a boomer population beginning to show up there, you know, that there were people in their 30s and their 40s, and they were looking for comfortable, casual clothing. 
So he began expanding his product assortment. He got beyond sweaters to, sh to blouses and bottoms, and then he started looking around the world for other quirky kind of products that were unique and different and would differentiate his store from what other stores were carrying. So he went to Guatemala and he found some villages where he began sourcing product from. He went to Turkey because in his mind at the time it was all about cotton as a fabrication. So he, he would source anywhere he thought that they made cotton products that were unique. So Marvin would go on these buying trips and they would bring, he would buy product and bring it back to Sanibel Island. And he was so successful, he opened another store and another store and another store. In 1993, 10 years later, they had grown the chain to like 30 stores and they did an IPO. They uh, began trading the stock. And by that time, he was clear, they were clearly defined as a casual apparel retailer. They had some franchise locations. A lot of small uh, specialty retailers begin growing through franchising because they don't have the working capital to be able to expand. And they had some company-owned stores. So they did the IPO. And they, can, they had a couple of rocky years, and Marvin and Helene exited the business shortly after the IPO. And then they came back in the business because the company almost went bankrupt. Uh, and they reoriented the business, hired some more people, and some of the new merchandising people they brought in began to bring new fabrications, new styling, but they clearly honed in on what at the time was the forgotten middle-aged woman. And what were the, the key ingredients in terms of product for their success? First of all, the product was relatively unstructured. It wasn't fitted. It was loose fitting. It was very, they, they really had a focus on comfortable fabrics. Uh, things like waistbands with a little bit of elastic in them and so on, materials that, that, that could make, that people could look good and they could do fashion with them, but at the same time that they were very comfortable. The second thing was mix and match. I mean, you know, the, the product flow was such that the, the pieces coordinated well with each other. So if you bought into the base, which is called Travelers, which is a, 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 an acetate uh, knit garment, uh, pants and tops and so on, then they put very, it's mostly a black, in, most of it's sold in black. They then put, they then added novelty pieces in terms of fun, colorful jackets and t-shirts and a lot of ethnic prints or embroidered products that, that coordinated well. So you could literally build a Chico's wardrobe over time. And women really liked that because a lot of them were still in the workplace. And so they liked the idea that they could build a, a fashionable wardrobe that was you know, it wasn't as straight-laced and conservative as, say, you would get at Talbot's or Ann Taylor, but it was kind of quirky, just like the, the Grelnicks were, and it had brought a personality. And then they, they evolved into accessories, the jewelry business, with some relatively inexpensive jewelry pieces that coordinated belts and, and other leather goods. So they built out a product because they had this knowledge of their customer, and they really perceived that this customer was not served by traditional retailers. So, and the, then you'll notice 1999 Passport Loyalty Program introduced. The Grelnicks were able to recognize that it wasn't about a store and product, but they, they, were, one, they were they were able to grasp the concept of the specialty retail store as a brand. And the brand experience is, in essence, the product that they were selling wasn't just a garment, but it was a brand experience. So they 
hired a, stores, a chief stores officer who had this vision of a high level of service. And they did a lot of things that were counterintuitive. At the, if you go back into the 80s and the 90s, most retailers were pulling back on the number of associates in the stores. They were taking people off commission or incentive. And the Grelnicks went absolutely the other way. In their mind, it was all about you come in, the store experience is supposed to be fun, and so they hired more people so that when you came in, you could get personalized service. And they paid these people on commission. So that the, and, and, it, and the commission got higher the more you sold. So you shared in every sale. So then they ended up with committed associates who would develop their customers and it became a very intimate thing. In 1999, they introduced what we call Passport, which is our loyalty program. And basically, to join Passport, all you have to do is buy $500 worth of merchandise in your life. As soon as you cross the $500 threshold, forever you get 5% off anything you buy in the store, even if it's on sale or marked down, and you get free shipping on anything you buy through our catalog or, or the internet. And Passport really helped to also make women feel like they were part of something special. It was almost like it was a club. And so the company, Passport helped them a lot. In 2003, Scott Edmonds was named the CEO. Scott's my boss. He's a great guy. His daughter actually attends FIT here. I believe she's a second year student. And he, the Grelnicks retired at that time, and he has continued kind of the strategy that they developed in terms of um, the product, the store, and then the other element is the marketing, which I spoke to the Passport Club, which is part of the marketing, and the catalog that Alice showed you is also uh, a, par a major part of our marketing program. And if you look at the catalog, you'll see that it's not just about product, it's, it communicates what the Chico's lifestyle is all about. And women that are in the brand franchise look forward to receiving this catalog uh, every month. In 2003, one of the things we recognized is that the, br that the Chico's brand would reach kind of a mature stage in its development. Uh, in, it, at the t in 2003, when we bought White House Black Market, the Chico's business was growing at something like 40% a year. But management was far-sighted enough to recognize that one brand could not sustain and be unlimited in size. Because don't forget, part of the brand, what makes the brand special is it's this kind of intimate, kind of club-like environment. And you can't include everyone and still have that intimacy. So we bought White House Black Market, which at the time had 90 stores. It was headquartered in Annapolis, Maryland. And it was all about product in white for women, a little bit younger target, but it was all about white and black and various combinations thereof. And we, one of the things, because the Chico's business was so successful, we were able to pour the cash that Chico's was generating into rolling out White House Black Market stores. And White House Black Market today is about a half a billion dollar business just uh, three years later because we've opened stores and we, we started a catalog and a loyalty program, which we call the Black Book, very similar to the Passport program, and so on. So, diversification. In 2004, we introduced our intimate apparel line, Soma. In 2005, we purchased a minority interest in a West Coast, Portland, Oregon-based women's activewear company called Lucy. And again, it's, an, it's another specialty retail concept. And then in 2006, we purchased a small Scottsdale, Arizona space specialty retailer called Fatigues. Our business profile 
one of the things in, in when you're running a business, you have to be very clear as to who you are, because as soon as you lose focus of that, your business begi results begin to, to show it. We are a women's fashion apparel retailer. We have four branded concepts, Chico's, White House Black Market, Soma by Chico's, and Fatigues. As I said, Lucy is a, we partially own, so we don't right now include it in our brand portfolio. We have 847 stores in 47 states, Puerto Rico, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. We are catalog and e-commerce uh, as well for each of the brands. And all of our brands target upper, upper income, middle age cons customers with the possible exception of White House, which does have a demographic that goes down into the 20s. So let's talk about the Chico's brand. The target age is 35 plus, our median age is 54. Income level is 75,000 plus. Most of these women are not working. Uh, the market size is 14.8 million households. That's the potential size of the market. Our product is unique, contemporary, fun, fashionable, comfortable, with relaxed fit, easy care, and great value. Our stores provide outstanding customer service and have an average size of about 2,200 feet. That's net, not gross, so that would be about 2,800, 2,900 feet gross. Our promise to the customer is there's something new at Chico's every day. Our Chico's stores the length of the life of a product with the exception of our core traveler's collection is eight weeks or less. Our, if it hits the store today, it'll be gone. And we're in the fast fashion business, so that means we do a lot, but we do very little of it. So think about this. If we have 500 Chico's, let's, let's look in round numbers as to how this works. If we have 500 Chico stores, we would, might cut, and, and by the way, we only have four sizes. We don't use traditional sizing. Our sizes are zero through three. They pretty much correspond to zeros, a six, a, to, and so on. It, it kind of works like that. Um, but the way it works is we'll cut, say, 5,000 pieces. That'll be 10 pieces per store. So no, into, no one size will get more than, say, three pieces depending on how we fill the store. And it means that if a woman, what we've trained our customer is that if she comes in today and she sees something we put out today, remember we're not working on seasons, we have a constant flow of merchandise. There's something new at Chico's every day. There literally is something new on the floor every day. If she comes in today, those 10 pieces are on the floor. If she doesn't buy it today, she knows that if she walks in a week from now, it probably won't be there. So that's to make it, there's a lot of impulse purchasing in a Chico store. Here is some of the face of Chico's. You can see a storefront in Scottsdale, Arizona, and, then, and one in Durham, North Carolina. The Scottsdale is in an outdoor location. The Durham is in a mall. We're in a number, mo only about 40% of our locations are actually in malls. Most of our location are out of malls. And some of the products that we sell. White House Black Market, target age is really a 25 to 50 with a median of 42. Same income demographics. And actually, if you look at our customers, she tends to be a little more affluent than the Chico's customer. Again, the total market potential is about 14.4 million households. Our product is feminine, sophisticated fashion in shades of black and white. Our stores, again, have high service. It's a boutique atmosphere. If you go to the new White House Black Market store, if you've never been one, it has the feel of a local boutique. The average size is about 1,600 square feet net. Our promise to the customer, we make women feel beautiful. And here are some examples of the White House Black Market Store. Here's one in Lyndhurst, Ohio. And then there's some of our 
our products. So the fashion element in White House black market is a little more sophisticated than it is at Chico's. It's a little more elegant. It's, um, th there's a very much a dressy component to White House black market, but there, we're also developing a casual size of our business. In fact, we do sell denim in the store if you go there and you say, well, that's, you know, there obviously is black denim and there's white denim, but you'll see blue denim there. And our founder, who's also the chief merchant, would tell you that she views denim as a non-color. So don't ask me to explain it. Um, Soma, our new intimate apparel store. Our target is the Chico's Passport customer. I said the Chico's market potential was 14.8 million households. We currently have 6 million women in our database that are out of that 14 million. And as when we launched Intimate Apparel as a business, we went straight at that customer. Again, focus, focus, focus. Very narrow focus, do it well, drive a business. Uh, we then see our potential is growing to 14 million customers as we grow beyond the Chico's franchise. Our product is central, soft, contemporary, great fitting, foundation sleepwear, and active wear. Our stores have high service. It's kind of an intimate boutique. Our target size is about 1,800 square feet net. Our consumer promise is exceptional comfort style and service. Literally, we saw the, our, our customers at Chico's told us they hated shopping for intimate apparel at department stores. And I know for this age group, it's hard to believe, but they are intimidated by Victoria's Secret. And so we developed a store for a 35 plus woman who's beginning to feel changes in her body as she has children, as she puts on some weight, and as her body ages and, go, and begins to change its shape. So we have identified her needs and we are providing product for them. The face of Soma, so you can see our, our design is somewhat spa-like, comfortable, a place where she can be, you know, she, she can feel comforted, nurtured, and so on, uh, that we're a very pleasing, unthreatening type of environment. Fatigues, our newest brand, target age, our newest acquisition, 35 to 55, income. This one is very high end. Fatigues began as a wholesale business and then changed to a retail business. It used to be, when it was a wholesale business, its, its distribution was Saks, Neiman Marcus, Bergdorf Goodman, and so on. Four and a half million households we see as the target. Unique design details, authentic, luxurious, fun, comfortable, and relaxed. Relatively small stores compared to our other concepts. Promise is clothes you'll love to live in. Again, another business founded by an entrepreneurial couple. One of the characteristics of all of our brands, with the exception of Soma, which you could think of as a brand extension, all of these brands were founded by couples. And they all had a vision of a consumer and what they could provide that consumer. So you can see here's a fatigue store in Scottsdale and some examples of the product. Our co the competition that we face with a specialty store business is department stores, local boutiques, other specialty chains, and you can see here for each of our store concepts who our competition is. For Chico's, it's called Water Creek, Fourth and Town, which is a division of the Gap, Talbot's, J. Jill, and Taylor. For White House Black Market, it's Banana Republic, Cache, Ann Taylor, Loft, BB, and maybe to a little bit Banana Republic. Uh, I'm sorry, I did say Banana Republic, sorry. Soma, we get about 12% of our business from Victoria's Secret. Uh, Cacique, which is Lane Bryant's uh, intimate apparel brand. Gap Body, and of course, department stores. Uh, we also compete with brand aware value retailers. Probably the, one of the greatest threats that we see and a company we follow very closely is Target because Target does understand the concept of the store as the brand 
and, this, and they certainly understand the concept of fashion. Our business strategies. Business strategies, how are we growing our business? Brand and store expansion certainly is one. We can roll out stores until we reach saturation. We also, in markets where we have small stores, as we develop a customer base, we can expand the size of the store. Unique and distinctive products. We can extend the brand into new product categories. As I mentioned, one of the things before the Grelnicks retired they had done is they had extended the Chico's brand into some accessory categories and into jewelry that coordinated with the product. Jewelry and accessories are over 20% of our business today. So certainly you can grow an apparel business with brand extension. White House Black Market does have a shoe business as well, which could be much larger than it is if we had the space in the stores. Exceptional personalized service. This is a differentiating source of competitive advantage. In retail today, uh, there are huge obstacles to providing levels of service, and if a retailer can overcome those obstacles and develop a one-on-one -on -one relationship involving human beings with a customer, it is a very powerful motivating factor to pur purchase. We have customers who have trust our sales associates as their fashion advisors, and we have high-income consumers, so these people sh li travel the world we literally have customers who have given their credit card numbers and information to our associates and who have said, when you see something that's right for me, buy it and send it to me. So to, assist, to build and sustain that level of trust uh, with a customer is a very special thing. Building customer loyalty through effective marketing. We talk to the customer through our catalogs, through direct mail. One of the powerful things about direct mail and the Passport Club, with the Passport Club recognized, we capture, by joining the class, Passport Club, we capture her, in, the information about her, where she lives, who she is, her birthday, and we use that information to market to her on an individual basis. She gets a birthday card from us every year with a discount if she has signed up with her birthday. We have five years of information in terms of what every Passport Club member has purchased in our stores. So in, turn, in exchange for the 5%, we give you as a discount, if you are a Passport Club member, we capture all of your transactions. So we know what she buys, when she buys, how much she buys, what she likes, what she doesn't, et cetera, et cetera, and that's a very powerful tool which helps us to both develop product as well as um, to, to speak to her and Marjorie. And then nurturing human capital is a huge part of our business strategy. Our success factors as a company, I spoke to consumer intimacy and all of its dimensions from product to the way we market to her to the personal service in the stores, all of that, brand development, frequent communication, risk, we manage risk across the organization by having a pool, a, a portfolio of brands, not relying on just one brand. We have extremely intimate supplier relationships. In the 20 some year history of the company, we have only fired two suppliers. Because what we require a supplier to do is to adapt to our business. We have the ability, if we can get fabric, we can turn product Today, if we have a product concept and we can get fabric to a cutting table somewhere in the world and get the patterns to that cutting table, we can turn that idea to a product in a store in 30 days. So you have to have the supplier relationship under that kind of design 
and customer service capability cannot be a buy, traditional buyer-seller relationship. It has to be a true partnership in terms of the, su the supplier has to know as much about our customer as we do, and they have to be willing to turn their organization upside down in order to deliver what we need to deliver to make our customer happy. Our real estate strategy, if you go into specialty retail, it's just like having a home. You hear in residential real estate, location, location, location. If you have a bad location, you have no customers. So real estate and finding the right locations is critical. Our leadership team, and I underlined team and highlighted it, we operate as a team. Think about a great basketball player where one one uh, player can be running down the court and he flips the ball over back and somebody dunks it in the basket and you don't even think they, they anticipate moves and so on. We work horizontally as a team. We don't have a lot of layers in bureaucracy. Focus and discipline. I spoke to focus early in the presentation. We are laser sharp on what we try to do. Too many companies try to do too many things and they don't do any of them well. We know our customer, we know what she responds to, and we are 100% committed to delivering that every day. Our culture has great values. It's about nurturing people, making people feel part of a family, and we have great financials. We have $300 million in cash and no debt. Some of the amazing stories, uh, we've grown, this is our stores, we, since 2001, we've grown our store base by almost 25%. This gives you some examples. We have 421 stores that are freestanding specialty center strip, 106 on streets, malls, about 200 stores. Our comp store sales in recent years, as our business has grown, has this year in particular, we've dropped from double digits to single digits. A lot of that is due to the maturing of the Core Chico's brand as it crosses 500 stores, while our newer brands, which are growing at double digits comps, are not large enough part of the base to add on to to average out with our comp in double digits. Our sales results have been phenomenal. You can see there, uh, we had, well, last year we grew 32%, the year before 39, the year before that 45, and so on. Our sales rate had, this the first eight months of this year, we grew at about a 17% rate. Our gross margins are some of the best in the industry. You can see year to date, we're at about a 61% gross margin. Our SG&A is a percent of sales. As the company grows, it declines. We run about 40% of sales. Our earnings per share growth has been nothing short of phenomenal. And our just some of the highlights, our operating income, so that's pre-tax income, has exceeded 21% of the sale, sales for the last three years. We have over two, we have really about 300 million in cash. Our long-term debt is zero. We turn our inventory four to five times a year. Our average sales per square foot exceed $1,000 on this Chico's brand, which is very, very high. Our market capitalization is over $4 billion, and we, our stock trades at about a 20 multiple. So how do we balance our long-term investment and growth with Wall Street short-term expectations? Uh, earlier this year, we reported one cent earnings per share less than Wall Street expected, and our stock price literally dropped in half. Um, it decreased our market capitalization by $4 billion. So one day we were $8 billion market cap, and the next day we woke up, or about two weeks later, we woke up with a $4 billion market cap. Our answer is we're managing the business for the long term. We're, we've in, we invest in new brands. We're investing in new business, intimate apparel and activewear. 
We're investing in human capital, skills, and depth of talent. Information systems, we're putting in SAP, which is a major uh, systems platform. We're developing in a big way, we hope to explode over the next couple of years, our e-commerce business. And we continue to invest in other infrastructure, our store payroll, market and competitive intelligence. We're expanding our corporate campus in Fort Myers. We're expanding our distribution center. And we're growing our store base by 20% a year. So where do we go from here? And I'll open it up. Before I open it up for questions, I'll just give you one last thought. If your customer wakes up tomorrow and your brand or store doesn't exist, will it really, really matter? One of the great things about working on the Chico's brand, I truly believe that if our stores failed to open tomorrow, it would really matter. It's a great day to be at Chico's, White House Black Market, Soma, and Fatigues. Come see us at the new White House Black Market store at 136 Fifth Avenue, open today. And I'm open for questions. Yes. With fulfillment, we're, our e-commerce business, our total direct business is, uh, last year was about $35 million, which we, our sales last year were about a billion four, so we have a very underdeveloped e-commerce. What we have is, um, we have a, at our central distribution facility, we have a side distribution facility that fulfills e-commerce orders, so if you, pick up our, we ha obviously we have inventory that's stored there, and literally you can order on the web, and we just pack it up and ship it to you. I mean, it's next to our main warehouse, so literally if, let's, I mean, it's hard to predict what's going to be, um, it's hard to predict exactly what the SKUs are going to be needed and so on, because in apparel, you know, you break SKUs. So, we have systems that will allow us to pull from the store inventory. So you may order, let's say, one of the parts of our most amazing personal service, if you go to a store today and we don't have your size, we'll find it in another store or in our warehouse and ship it to you. If you're a member of one of our loyalty clubs, that shipment is free to you. So the same, we can, if we don't have it in, the distribution center, you, we will look for it in one of our stores and ship it to you. Yes? Yeah. Yeah, it's something we struggle with every day. Actually, it's one of the greatest uh, challenges to the merchants, which is how do you grow, how do you bring new people into the franchise underneath and provide styling that appeals to them while at the same time holding on to your existing core consumer as she ages? So we try to what we try to do is provide a mix within the environment. And uh, obviously the other thing we do is with our marketing, since most of our marketing is direct to consumer in some kind of mailer, we try to target our marketing to prospects. Uh, that catalog Alice uh, showed you, for example, our holiday catalog, uh, our mailing list has six million people on it. We bought another two million names for prospecting that that catalog went to. Yes. The design team for all of our businesses is located in sunny Fort Myers, Florida. 
Uh, we, uh, we feel that our, our current strategy, we have a belief that the brand, in order to be as intimate as we think it has to be, that everybody needs to be together. And so we, you know, we have to sell you on uh, Florida sunshine, water sports, and so on, uh, in order to get you to come down and, and, and join our company. Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, in 1994, um, the, this is this is kind of the case story. In the United Kingdom, uh, we uh, well, okay. The Wonder Bra was developed in 1963 by Canadell, which is uh, a Canadian intimate apparel producer. Uh, and it was a push-up bra that, if you look at the original Wonder Bra, instead of, if you laid the product out, instead of the wings of the garment extending out to the side as a regular, the bra wings, if you were laying the product flat, extended down. And it had fiber-filled padding in the cup. So when the customer put the product on, those wings came around and it pushed the fiber fill up against the breast and caused dramatic cleavage. Okay, that product, and so it, 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 that was the wonder in Wonder Bra. The product was licensed to Gossard in the United Kingdom. It was a very strong style in Canada. It was licensed to Gossard in the United Kingdom. In 1994, Sara Lee bought Playtex and, and the Gassard license was expiring. And since Playtex had an operating company in the UK, we elected not to license the um, product to uh, Gassard going forward. And it was a huge part of their business, so they could not afford to let that business go away. So they announced that they were going to, when, when the license expired, they were going to introduce a new super push-up bra called the Ultra Bra. Well, the Playtex UK people then decided we have to do something because, you know, you think about it, they can't enter the market, they have no market position with Wonder Bra. Literally, the license is going to fire, expire December 31st. You can't start selling product till January 1. You don't have distribution. You don't have anything. So, you know, they have to make Wonder Bra the preferred product to the Ultra Bra, knowing that Gossard is going to be out there marketing the heck out of the, the Ultra Bra. So they developed this whole campaign with us in the U.S., because we got interested in all this and said, let's introduce this in the U.S. at the same time. And it was all about Wonder Bra being the greatest super push-up bra on the planet. And at the time, necklines were plunging, literally, people, cleavage was in, and it was all just timed right. So we hired Eva Herzegova. We did uh, this campaign that was very cheeky, and there were, I, for those of you who may not have seen some of the ads, they were black and white. Uh, she was very busty. And they had these phrases. So you'd see her, and she had this smile that was kind of uh, fun. It was all about fun. It wasn't, it was, it was flirty. It wasn't trashy. But there would be things like, uh, you'd see this caption, there she is with her Wonder Bra, and the caption on the ad would say, look me in the eyes and tell me you love me. Um, or it would say, um, who needs mistletoe at Christmas? Uh, so it was very, it, the ad campaign itself generated a lot of buzz. People were talking about Wonder Bra. Dave Letterman did a top 10 on Wonder Bra. I mean, it was a, we hired a public relations firm here in New York, Marina Mar Communications, and they did a fabulous job of getting the buzz out there. Uh, so for a year, about a year and a half, it was all about Wonder Bra in the intimates business. Yes? Uh, 
The reason for that is we're in a fashion business, and don't forget we're in a fast fashion business. We're constantly introducing new products. So if we get an idea that we think will make a significant impact on a season or at a point in time, and we can execute it, we have the capability of doing it. In reality, most of our product takes about four months to come from concept to the floor. But what we try to do is, you know, the inventory in the fashion business, the longer your lead times, the more inventory risk there is, and there's also more risk that the idea will not play out when it hits the floor. So every fashion manufacturer or retailer wants to have the least amount of time possible to execute and bring fashion to the floor. Yes? We don't talk to the customer about it, no. The customer really, other than looking in our catalog, uh, which she gets monthly, our customer doesn't know what to expect from us when. And that's part of the magic of the brand, is it's about the unexpected. The brand promised there's something new every day at Chico's. We want her to keep coming back. But if there's something that's hot, we expect to be delivering it. Yes. Um, one of the great things about the customer we have as well as the business model, we fly 90% of our merchandise, okay? Uh, we, as I said, our, our gross margins are in the 60s. Our initial markups are in the 70s. So the cost of product and getting it here isn't really that important in our business model. I mean, it's important, but I mean, we're not, again, we're flying 90% of what we, what we buy. Uh, as far as what countries we're in, uh, we're in about 32 countries probably today. But if you look at our business model too, we do very little direct sourcing. Most, we work through middlemen who have design capabilities. Because part of our model is if you, if you have a design team that is slow, solely reliant on its internal ideas for creativity, it's going to get inbred, it's going to get narrow. And so we're constantly challenging our vendors to bring us ideas. Now, we may chicofy those ideas when they bring them to us, but in order to be a vendor partner of ours, you can't just execute the, the designs we give us. You have to be giving us something as well. Which that means that if you have, let's say, 30 to 40 resources, you're getting input from them all the time and new ideas. You, other questions? <laughs> right, we do have a design team. We have, we have every element of design. We have technical design, we have creative design, we have design support people, cab pe people, material specs people, planners, buyers, merchants, you name it. We have them all and we're always hiring. One of the great things about being in a growth company like we are, where we're building our business 20% of the year, 20% a year we have jobs. And we're not in a bad place to live either. You know, it, particularly if you like to boat, fish, water ski, South Beach is only two, two hours away by car. Uh, it's not a bad place to live. <laughs> Any other questions? I <laughs> Thank you all. And if um,
if anybody would like to visit White House Black Market, I have a VIP card that is, will give you a 25% discount.
of a cold call is to see if there's a fit. The initial goal of a cold call is to see if there's a fit. Not to get the appointment, not to get the sale. Now, I haven't lost my mind. I realize that's the ultimate goal. It's just not where you're going to focus on when you first pick up the phone and make the call. Now, can someone share with me, if you change your mindset from, oh my God, I got to make the sale, oh my God, I got to get that appointment, to let me just see if there's a fit. How does that change your mindset and how you feel? Yeah, it takes the pressure off. Absolutely. Thank you. Yes. Ooh, great languaging. You take your power back. Thank you for that. Anything else? It relieves the pressure. Yes. Thank you very much. And it really makes it about the customer. Doesn't that support what we talked about earlier? Selling is the art of creating new possibilities. Well, how do you create new possibilities? You ask questions, you probe, you discover. And here we are saying that the goal of an initial call is to see if there's a fit. How do we determine if something's a fit? We ask questions. We ask more questions to determine if there's a fit. What does that do? It puts a whole new meaning to the phrase qualify your prospects. You see, now you're the ones doing the qualifying. It puts the power back to your court rather than you feeling the need to have to push yourself through or be on the defensive. Now it's, wait a second, let me see if they're a good fit for my business. Would everyone agree that there's a lot of business out there to be had? Okay, which means you don't have to sell everybody. You're not going to sell everybody because we just determined that the goal of an initial call is to see if there's a good fit. And something that I learned a long time ago, folks, is this. If you want to develop and if you want to build a business that you hate, then work with people that you cannot stand. If they're not a fit, move on. And you're going to know if there's a fit because you're going to be doing a much better job qualifying your prospects to determine if they're a good fit for what you're selling. And are they a good fit for your business? So once again, asking questions to determine if there's a fit. Now that we've uncovered some ways so that you can think like a true champion, let's go ahead and get a little tactical now. We've talked about being a process-driven thinker. Let's apply that now to, the, to your process, to your sales process. Does anyone here, by the way, just by a show of hands, have a set sales process that they follow from the time they make that call all the way to the end of earning that person's business? Look around the room, folks. OK, you're not alone. And isn't this amazing how successful you've been without a sales process? Imagine how dangerous you're going to be when you develop one that really works for you. You're going to be unstoppable. So let's talk about what encompasses that successful call, that successful presentation. And and by the way, some of the things we're going to be talking about now, which are focusing on the power of questions, can be used both in that initial introductory call that you make, as well as when you're meeting with uh, your potential uh, customers. To illustrate uh, what we're going to be talking about, I remember uh, calling um, a company I wanted to advertise with. Um, I happened to write their column for their sales, every, their monthly sales column every month, so I knew a lot about the magazine. All I wanted to do was pick up the phone and put my order in. That's all I wanted to do. So when I called up the sales office and the salesperson picked up the phone, she did what she thought she needed to do, which was to start selling me and to start pitching me. And she started telling me all the wonderful things about her company and the publication and the circulation and the demographics and the geographics, which is all information I already knew. So while this person was talking at me, 
all I kept thinking about were all the sales that she must be losing as a result of her sales approach. A sales call, a cold call, a meeting, and I know this might sound strange, is not where you're going to dump all of your years of knowledge and wisdom on the customer or the prospect. It's when you take the opportunity to find out what they want to know, what they need to know, and what they don't know about you and your product and how you can work together. So, we're going to focus on the power of questions. So turn to page six in your handbook. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I realize that some of you may have a little bit of a different sales process from the person next to you. Some of your products might be priced differently. Your sales cycle might be a little different. However, there are certain core competencies that are consistent what, through whatever you're selling. And the one of them is the art of asking well-crafted questions. There's that creativity again, folks. Well-crafted questions. Why do we ask questions? Why do we ask questions?